you so very much for tuning in here today at Church on the Rock. If this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusOfTheRock.org. There you can find out all sorts of information on our ministries, or you can give to our church financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us, and welcome to Church on the Rock. Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to start with verse 8. It says, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land, another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. I do that all the time. Even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren, and when she was too old, she believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from one man who was as good as dead, a nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand of the seashore, there is no way to count them. The King James, I like because I really want to use for a text this morning, verse 11. It says, through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Because she judged him faithful who had promised. God is faithful. God is faithful. 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, he's faithful. And he's just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful. I'm so glad that I don't have to worry about if God's in a bad mood or not. Right? If God's having a bad day, maybe he's not going to care about what's going on in my life. Maybe he'll just say, I'm not forgiving anybody today. No, he doesn't do that because he's faithful. What is faithful? What does it mean to be faithful? Well, among other things, it means trustworthy. To be faithful means you can trust me. You can trust me. I don't know about you, but I like to be around faithful people. I like to be around people that I can trust. I want a spouse who's trustworthy. I want children I can trust. I want friends I can trust. I want leaders I can trust. And God is our supreme example because he's faithful all the time. All the time, God is faithful. You don't have to worry about God stabbing you in the back. You don't have to worry about God pulling a fast one on you. You don't have to worry about him conniving and doing this. James 1.17 says there's no shadow of his turning. Roger's translation to that is God's not shady. There's no shadow of his turning. He's never going to change. He said, I am the Lord. I change not. Verse 11, again, says that through faith also, Sarah herself, everybody say Sarah herself. Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed because she was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Sarah judged God to be faithful. She made a decision. She made a judicial decision. She judged him faithful. Why? Because he promised. I love that. She judged him faithful because he promised. And that was enough. I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know where, but he promised. And I believe it, I'm judging him faithful. No earnest money, no contract, just his word. How many remember when you could do business on a handshake? How many know those days are over? Best friends sue you. Unless you're dealing with God. God still does deals on a handshake. God does deals on a prayer. He's faithful. The same today, yesterday, and forever, he's still faithful. If he said he'll do it, that's all the explanation you need. 
He promised. Somebody looks at you and say, well, I don't know how you're going to do that. You say, me either, but he promised. And he's faithful. I don't know how he's going to do it, when he's going to do it, where he's going to do it, but he promised, so I don't have to worry about it. All I have to do is believe. The scripture tells us in one place, if thou canst believe, all things are possible. If you can believe. If you will just judge God faithful. If you will just believe that God is faithful. Now, I love this chapter of Hebrews. We call it the heroes of faith. It's it's God's trophy case. It's the hall of fame. If you read through Hebrews 11, it is the hall of fame. It talks about what all of these great people did, the great things they accomplished. It's, it's It's the who's who of the Bible. However, there's something strange. If you read through this list of names here, one thing sort of jumps out at you. Here it is. Think about it. It, You can go back and read. You you read through all these names. By faith, Noah built a large boat to save his family. By faith, Abraham, uh, when God called him to go to another land. It was by faith, Abel brought a more uh, uh, acceptable sacrifice than Cain. You read all of these great things they did. But if you go back and you read their story, you can find failure in almost every life. In every one of them, you can find failure. Noah got drunk, passed out in his tent. Abraham lied about his wife, said she was his sister to save his own hide. Jacob stole his brother's birthright, on and on and on. But the interesting thing is, none of that's recorded here in the New Testament. All we read about here are their accomplishments. What great things they did for God. Why is that? I'll tell you why. Because God is faithful. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when God talks about our future self, all he sees is the good. All he talks about is the good. He doesn't even remember the bad. None of their sins made the cut into the New Testament. We can read about them when they did it. We can read about how wretched they were, murder and adultery and lying and killing and stealing, all that. But when we read about them in the New Testament, we see them through the eyes of grace. We see them through the eyes of the blood of Jesus Christ, and all we see is the good. The Bible said that God uh, forgives our sin, and he remembers them no more. He casts them into the sea of forgetfulness. He moves them from his mind as far as the east is from the west. He can, One day, we're going to stand before God, and, and all he's going to see is our goodness because he sees it through the lens of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why he's going to say, enter in my good and faithful servant. And you're looking around like, who's good and faithful? That wasn't me. And God said, oh, yeah, that's all I see. Is good and faithful because I see you through the blood of my son, Jesus Christ. Our sins won't make the cut. God sees our good. Why? Because he's faithful. What I really want to talk to you on this Mother's Day about, though, is Sarah. See, whenever you mention Abraham and his faithfulness, you, you almost automatically think of his son, Isaac. Isaac. But it's interesting that when Abraham's written about here, it talks about him looking for a city whose builder and maker is God, and it talks about how he went and he trusted God and he believed God doing all of this stuff. But when it comes to Isaac and his miraculous conception, it doesn't even mention Abraham except to say he was dead. In other words, he he was way past childbearing age. He was way past the ability to father a child. He he basically says he added nothing to it. You know, it was he was good as dead in verse number 12. It says, therefore sprang there even one and him as good as dead. Abraham. He was good as dead. That's all it has to say about him. But the Bible seems to give credit to Sarah for this event. Verse 11, through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who promised. So so the Bible gives the credit to Sarah for judging God faithful and conceiving a child and giving birth to a child. I mean, we talk a lot about Father Abraham, but I want us to take a look at Mother Sarah, right? Right? Mother Sarah, Sarah herself, not the patriarch, the matriarch, the mother. Abraham may have been the father of many nations, but Sarah was the mother 
of many nations. Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. Somebody, I think, just needs to hear that today. Sarah herself. It's not just about what your husband can do. It's not about what the pastor can do. It's not about what your church is doing. It's not about what your friends are doing. But Sarah herself, you yourself can receive strength when you can't get the preacher to pray for you, when you can't get your friends to pray for you, when you can't get your family to do right. You yourself can receive strength. Sometimes you just have to encourage yourself in the Lord. You can't seem like everybody else is letting you down. Everybody else is not doing what they should do. God may be wanting you to give birth to a certain ministry. God may be wanting you to give birth to a certain dream in your life. And you've got this dream, but you don't really talk about it because, you know, I just don't think I can do it. I don't, you know, I always think of Dr. Martin Luther King. He was never famous for saying, I have a problem. Was he? He was famous for saying, I have a dream. Dr. Martin Luther King himself he had a dream, and he gave birth to that dream because he judged God faithful. He trusted God to help him and to do, and, and gave birth to a revolution. You yourself can receive strength to concede. All right, let's, let's talk a little bit about Sarah. Sarah was the first lady to be mentioned in the Hall of Faith. There would be others, but she was the first. You, you might say that she broke the glass ceiling. She was the one who started the, uh, the, the, the revolution here of ladies in the hall of faith. She broke through a male-dominated society. Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed because she judged him faithful who had promised. I'm going to go back and read out of Genesis because I want to give you just a little bit of the history here of what actually went on. Genesis 18 some of you may be saying, well, that's wonderful for Sarah. That's great for Abraham and Noah and Isaac and Abel and all, all of these people, you know, that we read about there. But, uh, you know, let's, let's face it. That was Sarah and Abraham and Noah and Moses. But I'm me. I, I'm me. I mess up so many times. I'm, I'm, I'm doing, but see, that, that's, that's the thing here. What I want you to remember is that when we read about these people in Hebrews 11, we're seeing them through the eyes of God's grace. That, that's, what, that's what I'm telling you when we go back and we look at them, and like Paul Harvey, we get the rest of the story. We find people just like you and I. All right, let's read out of Genesis 18. Verse 1, it says, The Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove belonging, belonging to Mamre. One day Abraham was sitting at the entrance to his tent door, in the hottest part of the day, he looked up and noticed three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran to meet them and welcomed them, bowing low to the ground. My Lord, he said, if it pleases you to stop here for a while, rest in the shade of this tree while water is brought to wash your feet. And since you've honored your servant with this visit, let me prepare some food to refresh you before you continue on your journey. All right, they said, do as you have said. So Abraham ran back to the tent and said to Sarah, hurry, get three large measures of your best flour, knead it in the dough, and bake some bread. Then Abraham ran out to the herd and chose a tender calf and gave it to his servants who quickly prepared it. When the food was ready, Abraham took some yogurt and milk and roasted meat and served it to the men. As they ate, Abraham waited on them in the shade of the trees. Where is Sarah, your wife, they asked. She's inside the tent, Abraham replied. Then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year, and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she, she laughed silently to herself, and she said, how could a worn-out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is also old? Even if I could, he can't. How's this going to be? So the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? 
Why don't you laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, I can't have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she denied it, saying, I didn't laugh. (laughs) But the Lord said, no, you did laugh. No, you did laugh. Sarah laughed at God. Sarah laughed at the promises of God. Now, we read about her in Hebrews 11, and all we read is that Sarah judged God faithful, and she conceived a son and bore a son. But here we get the rest of the story. Sarah laughed. Verse 12 says she laughed within herself, or she laughed silently. But see, that's a problem when you're dealing with God because God hears silent laugh. God hears silent. God hears your thoughts. All, all, through, all through the Scripture, even in the New Testament, it said people would think within themselves and Jesus would answer their thoughts. He knows our thoughts. And when Sarah laughed to herself, the angels of the Lord answered her. Do you know when you worry and when you get depressed over things and you get all, you know, doubt and unbelief and all this, do you know that in reality you're laughing at God? You're laughing at God. You're laughing at the promises of God. When you begin to doubt and get defeated over your circumstances and start whining and start complaining, you're laughing at God. When you decide you're going to fix things on your own, you're tired of waiting on God, you're laughing at God. You're saying to God, I can handle this better than you can. So I'm just going to take care of it myself. Understand that, that God can deal with your problems. God can deal with your circumstances. God can deal with your barren womb. He can deal with your old age. He can deal with your weakness. But the one thing God will not do is override an attitude of unbelief. He heard Sarah laugh. Well, what happened when Sarah laughed? God left. God left. She didn't conceive because God won't override an attitude of unbelief. However, just because we're not faithful doesn't mean God's not faithful. Verse 14 says, at the appointed time in about a year, I will return unto thee. Sarah will have a son. You know what God was saying? God said, I made a promise and I will keep my word. The only problem is Sarah's not ready right now. Sarah's laughing at the promises of God right now. She's not faithful, but I'll still be faithful. I'm coming back. I'm coming back, and Sarah will have the son. At the appointed time, I will return. So concerning Sarah's miracle child, God just put it over here in another file and stamped it delayed but not denied. Delayed but not denied. Some of your miracles, some of the things that you've been praying for, some of the things God's promised you has been put in a file and stamped delayed but not denied. Why? Because God's got to get you ready to receive your miracle. If some of you receive the things you're praying for and asking for right now, it would destroy you. God says, you're not ready for it. I know you're asking, let me hit the lottery and I can win $400 million. God said, it'd kill you. You're not ready for it. You're not ready for it. I made you some promises, and I'm going to fulfill the promises, but I have to get you prepared. Now, we flip over to chapter 21. It says, now the Lord kept his word. Imagine that. The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. She became pregnant, and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God said it would. And Abraham named the son Isaac. Eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this will laugh with me. Now, here's Sarah laughing again, but the difference is the first time Sarah was laughing at God, this time she's laughing with God. You see the difference? 
with doubt and unbelief and saying, I don't know, I can't do this. I don't know how to do it. That's laughing at God. But when God has blessed you and God, do you see the promises fulfilled and you're just overjoyed and you begin to worship him and praise him, now you're laughing with God. God's saying, you know, I, that, that, that the promise is here, you've done it, and now we laugh with God. All right, real quickly, how did Sarah go from laughing at God to laughing with God? And maybe we could even ask the question this morning, this one question. If you ask it and answer it in your own mind, right now, concerning your life, your dreams, your circumstances, the promise God has made to you, are you laughing at God or with God? It may determine when and how and where you get your miracle. Doubt and unbelief and worry and anxiety and fretting and trying to fix things and does laughs at God. Judging God faithful, saying I may not see it, hear it, feel it, but I know God's faithful is laughing with God. How did Sarah move from laughing at God to laughing with God? In other words, how did she get prepared for a miracle? What, what happened during this span of time? Well, we don't have time to go back and read it all. You, you can do that later. But you remember when Abraham left for the south country and as they approached the city and the people came out and, and the king asked Abraham, Who's that with you? Because Sarah was good looking. And in those days when the king looked at somebody who struck his fancy, he would just take her. And if she was married, more times than not, the husband would just disappear. They would go away. And so Abraham was afraid, if I tell them this is my wife, I'm going to go away. He'll have my head, and he'll take Sarah for himself. So Abraham, Father Abraham, father of many nations, big, strong Abraham, whipped out and lied. He says, oh, her? That's my sister. That's my sister. Yeah, the king will still take her, but my life will be spared. And the king did take her. He told his people to go out and prepare her for him. King Abimelech. Now, get inside Sarah's head. She's scared. She's angry. She, she's no tramp. She's Abraham's wife. She's the first lady. And now she's another man's possession. I can't prove it because the Bible doesn't tell us. But I believe Sarah prayed. I believe she called out to God and said, help me. Help me. Don't let this thing happen to me. Do something. My husband can't help me now. My family can't help me now. I need you, Lord. If Sarah wasn't praying, somebody was praying. Because you can look at chapter 20 and verse 1. It says, Abraham moved south to Najib and lived for a while between Kadesh and Shur, and then he moved to uh, Gerar. While living there as a foreigner, Abraham introduced his wife Sarah by saying, she is my sister. So King Abimelech of Gerar sent for Sarah and had her brought to him at his palace. But that night, God came to Abimelech in a dream and told him, you are a dead man. For that woman you have taken is already married. Can you imagine when God comes to you and says, you're a dead man? And this is more like Clint Eastwood than God, right? Maurice, you're a dead man. You're a dead man. Because this woman you've taken is already married. You're a dead man. God was working on Sarah's behalf. God speaks to Abimelech and says, you better leave this woman alone. That's not one of your little darlings. That's my daughter, Sarah. Hands off. God was working on Sarah's behalf. Let, let's read verse four. But Abimelech had not slept with her yet, so he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Didn't Abraham tell me she's my sister? Abraham. 
didn't you? Abraham told me. But God flexed his muscle for Sarah. And suddenly, Sarah wasn't laughing at God anymore. Now she was laughing with God. Because the king, if you look over at verse 14, Abimelech took some of his sheep and goats and cattle, male and female servants, and he presented them to Abraham. He also returned his wife, Sarah, to him. Abimelech said, look over my land. Choose any place where you would like to live. And he said to Sarah, look, I'm giving your brother 1,000 pieces of silver in the presence of all these witnesses. This is to compensate you for any wrong I may have done to you. This will settle any claim against me, and your reputation is cleared. Then Abraham prayed to God. God healed Abimelech, his wife, his female servants, so they could have children. For the Lord had caused all the women to be infertile because of what happened with Abraham's wife, Sarah. Suddenly the king doesn't just let her go. He lets her go, gives her back to Abraham, said, here's some goats, some chickens, some pigs, some cows, and some servants, and some money, and what else you want? Because God said, let my daughter go, or you're a dead man. God stood up for Sarah. God proved himself faithful, and now Sarah's not laughing at God. She's laughing with God. She's proven God faithful. Suddenly, she realized my husband couldn't help me, but God helped me. My pastor couldn't help me, but God helped me. My friends weren't there, but God was there. Hebrews 11 says, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and delivered a child when she was way past age. Why? Because she judged him faithful who promised. It took Sarah getting into a mess where she had to trust God in order for God to prepare her for a miracle. Whenever you go through something and you're forced to trust God, it prepares you for his promise. That's why we shouldn't despise those things that cause us to force. We're forced to trust God because God's building something in us because God is wanting us to laugh with him, not at him. Have you judged God faithful? over the promises he made to you? Are you still laughing at God with doubt and unbelief? This can't happen. There's no way this can happen. I can't do this. I don't know what's going to happen because I can't do this. Or if you trust God to be faithful by saying, I trust you, Lord. Again, we're so incredibly glad you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. Now, if this message blessed you in any way, let us hear about it. You can email pray at jesusoftherock.org, or you can look us up on Facebook or Twitter, Church on the Rock, Pascagoula. Now, I pray that God shows you awesome ways to apply this message to your everyday life.